everybody. Hi, everybody. Can, can you hear me? OK, good. OK, great. Um, Chris, thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm just really thrilled to be here. It's so such a pleasure to be part of the Vermont Humanities Council, their program of events. It's really, it just feels so important now in this era when we're all being downsized and all the things we care about are being minimized that we are here tonight blossoming, blossoming in the uh, fields of, of literary studies. So I'm excited to talk to you here tonight about um, Toni Mor Morrison's uh, movie, excuse me, novel, Beloved. I don't know if anyone has seen the movie. I saw it recently, and there's some outstanding scenes. Actually, on the second viewing, I realized I liked it better than I remembered I liked it. So I, did, I do have one small clip I'm going to show you if my PowerPoint goes off uh, the way it should. There's no place you or I can go to think about or not think about, to summon the presences of or recollect the, uh, recollect the absences of slaves. Nothing that reminds us of the ones who made the journey and those who did not make it. There is no suitable memorial or plaque or wreath or wall or park or skyscraper lobby. There is no 300 foot tower. There is no small bench by the road. There is not even a tree scored, an initial that I can visit or you can visit in Charleston, Savannah, or New York, or Providence, or better still, on the banks of the Mississippi. And because such a place does not exist, the book had to. This is Toni Morrison from a 1989 interview in the world, uh, the magazine called The World. Beloved is the monument. Toni Morrison's inspiration for her uh, Pulitzer Prize winning 1987 novel, Beloved, was a newspaper clipping that she found in the pages of the Black Book. This is um, a book that was actually Morrison helped to edit, a 1974 scrapbook of sorts of the African American experience. In its pages were photographs of black men being lynched while white men stood by and smiled. It's remarkable, isn't it, how um, commonplace these images were. People kept these images, used them on postcards. Something we have to, I mean, just always remember how much this kind of brutality, it was part of the fabric of everyday life. And it structured, of course, engagement between black and white people. There are other images, of course, in the Black Book. There are um, ads for uh, slaves, of course. Um, in the book for the public sale of Negroes. Other ads for items like spool cotton and sunlight soap that featured, featured caricatures of black children. There are also images of families dressed in their Sunday finest and soldiers who helped break the color barrier in the US military. Morrison was among a team of editors actually who put this book together. Really, there hasn't any, been anything like it since. Among these pictures and newspaper clippings and sheet music and postcards was a small item about a slave called Margaret Garner, a mother who had killed one of her children rather than see her grow up in slavery. She had tried and failed to kill her other children too. A mulatto about five feet high showing one quarter or one third white blood. This is how she was described by Levi Cotton who was head of the Underground Railroad in the crucial border city of Cincinnati. She had a high forehead, her eyebrows were finely arched, and her eyes bright and intelligent. She appeared to be 22 or 23. She was dressed in dark calico with a white handkerchief arranged as a turban around her head. The babe she held in her arms was a little girl, about nine months old, and was much lighter in color than herself, light enough to show a little red in its cheeks. Originally on Garner's mind was not murder, but freedom. Along with seven other slaves in Kentucky, she had attempted to escape to Ohio, which was only several miles away. They had planned their escape very carefully over several months. All seven managed to cross the Ohio River, arriving in Covington by horse-driven sleighs. Once there, they divided up. One group made it to Canada via the Underground Railroad, the other group, Garner's group, which consisted of, consisted of her family, was discovered while they were hiding in the home of a free black man who had just left to find Cotton, whose role, excuse me, Co Levi Coffin, 
whose role it was to get the fugitive slaves to the next step on their journey. Garner and her family barricaded themselves inside the house where Garner killed her three-year-old girl. The oldest of her children was five. Garner was immediately jailed. A series of public hearings ensued. The newspapers carried day by day accounts of the proceedings as if they constituted a serialized novel. It was a scandal of its time. Every day the courtroom was packed. I, this is a still from an opera of, the, um, of Margaret Garner's story that was put on in Cincinnati. And there have been so many um, iterations of the story, people trying to translate it and understand it. Uh, obviously, the, film, the book, the film, but, but, but a lot. There are plays, and there are wonderful paintings. And I'm going to show you a couple of those images, too. When the indictment came, um, it, was a, it was a surprise. We find that said child, Mary Garner, was killed by its mother, Margaret Garner, with a butcher's knife with which she had cut its throat. Um, Garner had many sympathizers among abolitionists. They wanted her to be tried for murder, actually. It would have set a number of precedents, including establishing an enslaved person's right um, and responsibility vis-a-vis uh, -vis her own children. Instead, Margaret Garner was accused of destruction of property and remanded to slavery along with her husband. Among Garner's supporters was Lucy Stone, who was the most eloquent order of the female suffrage movement. And actually, the first person I read somewhere in the United States to keep her maiden name. Um, Stone addressed the crowded courtroom during the summation. After testimonies had been heard, she described having visited Garner in jail where she told her a thousand hearts were aching for her. The faded faces of the Negro children, she said, tell too plainly to what degradation female slaves submit. Rather than give her little daughter to that life, she killed it. If in her deep maternal love, she felt the impulse to save it from coming woe, who shall say she had no right to do so? That desire had its root in the deepest and holiest feelings of our nature, implanted alike in black and white by our common father. With my own teeth, would I rather tear open my veins and let the earth drink my blood rather than wear the chains of slavery? How then could I blame her for wishing her child to find freedom with God and the angels where no chains are? How can we blame her? It was the right thing to do, but she had no right to do it. This is what Toni Morrison says uh, about Garner's choice in a piece of a clip of a video I want to show you here. So I'm going to just. The way has to be on the thing. Let's see. You may have trouble playing that. Oh, really? Because of okay. All right. Um, I think it's on the laptop. Okay. Not on the flash okay. So maybe after the talk, just quickly, just a little sure. bit of Morrison writing about, you know, what it meant to write this book. And in the clip, she talks about the challenges of trying to reproduce the moment or represent the moment of the murder and how she had to get really quiet because the moment demanded not sensational language, but really forcing the reader to contend with this incredibly sober um, and obviously really grave choice. So she talked about getting out of the way of the moment and also about f insisting to herself that she not judge this woman. And she says in the clip, the only person or the only entity who had the right to judge the woman who murdered her children, who is Setha, is her daughter, the, the dead baby. So the book Beloved, as you all know, is about that, is about that baby and giving that baby voice. Beloved is not, and does not pretend to be, a faithful representation of the story of Margaret, Margaret Garner. Set in 1873, roughly a decade after the Emancipation Proclamation ended slavery, at least in theory, but Beloved is a story of Setha, a former slave who 18 years earlier had escaped to Ohio from Sweet Home, uh, a plantation in Kentucky. She sent her three children ahead of her 
two little boys and one yet unnamed girl. On the way, she gave birth to another daughter. It was called Denver. Setha is tracked to her new home by her slave owner. She reacts by cutting the throat of her crawling already older daughter and would have done the same with the other children had she not been stopped. For destruction of property, child as slave, she served a jail sentence. By the time she was released, the ghost of the dead baby, who's called Beloved, uh, the name that Setha had inscribed, that she had inscribed on the headstone of her grave. Beloved has come to, come to haunt the family um, and the house that it occupies. So these, these are again a gorgeous illustrated volume um, uh, from some stills from the, from the book. Partly because they feel encumbered by the destructive and terrifying ghost, and partly because they are afraid of their mother, who after all murdered their sister, the two boys leave home as soon as they feel they can take care of themselves. Setha and Denver accept the baby ghost and the disruption she causes as, as part of their lives. Everything changes when another former slave from Sweet Home arrives called Paul D. With brute force, he rids the house of the ghost, and he and Setha become lovers. Soon after an unknown young woman arrives, she behaves strangely and appears to be the age that the dead baby would have been had she lived. She calls herself beloved and soon becomes a powerful voice force in the house. Beloved forces Paul D. out, first from the house and then from Setha's life. Meanwhile, Setha, the target of Beloved's attention and the person from whom she seeks retribution, cannot keep from becoming completely enthralled by the intruder. For Setha believes that Beloved is the reincarnation of the child she murdered. As a result, Setha suffers physical and psychological deterioration until Denver, anxious for her mother's life, seeks help from the black women in the community. Under the gaze of the collective force of the women who respond to the call, Beloved disappears. And for the first time in her life, Denver finds the courage to make life plans that promise positive changes for the entire community. The story concludes with Paul D's return to a recovering Setha to whom he offers himself in a partnership for a life they might build together. Morrison said that the only way to tell the story she needed to tell was from the perspective of the child that was killed. Beloved is the only one entitled to sit in judgment upon Setha. Morrison said, I just imagined the life of the dead girl, which was the girl that Margaret Garner killed, and I called her beloved so that I could filter all those confrontations and questions that she has in the situation. Beloved is more than just a character in a novel. She is the embodiment of the past that must be remembered in order to be forgotten. She, she symbolizes what must be incarnate, reincarnated in order to be buried. She's the embodiment of re-memory, a term that dominates the book, and which means a kind of psychic haunting in which the specifics of a traumatic incident are told and retold, even as the teller tries to block their full emergence into the conscious mind. In a 1989 interview, Morrison called Beloved a book about something that the characters don't want to remember, I don't want to remember, black people don't want to remember, and white people don't want to remember. Morrison's project is monumental and precise. The project is to intervene in the tradition of national amnesia regarding this chapter in America's history. Just as the nation must come to grips with its history, so must the slave find a way to recognize the horrors of her past. The importance of our private memories become the basis for a reconstructed public history. In the tradition of African American literature, private memories and public history have always been intertwined since the inception of the tradition itself which begins with the slave narrative. Morrison acknowledges the influence of the slave narrative on her work. She wrote, the matrix of the work I do is to extend, fill, and complement slave autobiographical narratives. Slave narratives, com slave narratives comprise one of the most extensive and influential traditions in literature writ large. 
Nowhere else in the world can you find a body of work written by people testifying to the horrors and complexities of their own enslavement. As historical sources, slave narratives document slave life primarily um, in the American South from the invaluable perspective of firsthand experience. The most influential slave narratives of the antebellum era were designed to enlighten white readers about the realities of slavery as an institution and the humanity of black people of, as individuals deser deserving full human rights. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, slave narratives became an important means of opening a dialogue between whites and blacks about slavery and freedom. Whatever the, whatever the style and circumstances of these narratives, Morrison writes in her 1987 essay, The Sight of Memory, whatever the style and circumstances, they were written to say principally two things. One, this is my historical life, my singular special example that is personal, but also represents the race. And two, I must write this text to persuade other people, you, the reader, who is probably not black, that we are human beings worthy of God's grace and the immediate abandonment of slavery. But there was a creative cost for the writers of slave narratives who recognized their work as responding only to political urgency. Morrison writes, over and over, the writers pull the narrative up uh, with a phrase such as, but let us drop a veil over those proceedings too terrible to relate. In shaping the experience to make it palatable to those who were in a position to alleviate it, they were silent about many things, and they forgot many things. For me, she continues, a writer in the last quarter of the 20th century, not much more than 100 years after emancipation, a writer who is both black and a woman, my job becomes to rip that veil drawn over proceedings too terrible to relate. The exercise is also critical for any person who is black or who belongs to any marginalized category, for historically we were seldom invited to participate in the discourse even when we were its topic. The act of ripping the veil requires more than just recovery of buried stories. It requires invention. Memories and recollections won't give me total access to the unwritten interior lives of these people, Morrison writes. Only the act of imagination can help me. Slave narratives themselves have always been imaginative. Because of this, they were bestsellers as stories of tragic victims, perfect villains, and heroic escapes. Such drama translates easily to the silver screen. Among the most memorable cinematic adventures in the representation of slavery have been the 1997, um, that can't be right, 1997 miniseries, miniseries Roots. That was 79, I think, must be right. <laughs> Um, Sankofa, has anyone seen Sankofa? Beautiful movie, 1993. Amistad, 1997. 12 Years a Slave, um, uh, recently um, released a few years ago, 2013. And this uh, movie, Django Unchained, um, uh, Quentin Tarantino's, you know, the inimitable Quentin Tarantino's uh, interpretation of American slavery, which I actually really loved. And I wanted to use this still because I found Django absolutely riveting as a movie um, because of the way it reimagines this uh, iconic image from the era of, of American slavery. So this is an image simply called Peter the Slave. So this was circulated in a lot of abolitionist literature. And you can see why, how compelling this image is. I mean, I'm trying to tell you, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm taking to the abolitionist, to the lecture circuit. I'm a, and I'm, I'm giving you treatise after treatise and I'm making speeches. But nothing is more compelling that, that serves to explain to you how barbaric this institution is. Nothing more compelling than this photograph. So it was heavily circulated. This man actually was a Union soldier. Um, but the ravaged back of the black American slave is the most honest, honest and, mo and most absolutely legible account of slavery. It is the irrefutable evidence of the utter inhumanity of the institution. 
like the image called Peter the Slave, Django's scarred back is an image that needs no accompanying words in order to evoke our shame, disgust, and rage. The only thing is, uh, Tarantino tries to make it a very glamorous back. It's very interesting what he does. And of course, he uses the uh, scaffolding of the sp spaghetti western to tell the story of, 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 of a man escaping from slavery. But it's the back that was so compelling to me, the idea that this image can, be, can contain so many stories. Um, when we talk about American slavery, we say that the institution worked on the, man, the male body. Not only the lash, but these are among the instruments of torture that slaves uh, were forced to endure for minor and major offenses. These are among some of them. Um, and here's a, the bit that, uh, this is an example of um, the Paul D. wears in Beloved. Slavery acted upon the male body, and it also invaded the female body. Um, and when we look at these images, something Morrison wrote once that I always carry with me into my classrooms and tell my students, we should always be shocked. We should never become immune. Um, we have to confront these images and the history that they contain in the same way that Morrison asks us to confront the story of Margaret Garner and her novel. Slavery is terrible for men, Harriet Jacobs wrote in her masterful 1861 narrative, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, but it is far more terrible for women. Slavery acts upon the male body and also invades the female body. The sexual exploitation of enslaved black women was its own instrument of torture and so widespread that it is a staple feature in the writings of those who witnessed and experienced black life under slavery. Y you might remember the comment, uh, Lucy Stone talked about how light and color the children were, and she didn't have to spell it out. We know why this came to be so, and what Margaret Garner was trying to protect her children from. In Beloved Setha, pays for the engraving on her dead daughter's tombstone by submitting to 10 minutes of sex with the engraver while his sons watched. The maternity of enslaved black women was overdetermined and considered another right of the slave owner. This, the, the scenes, of course, of uh, many images, photographs of uh, black women nursing white babies. And this was just a, you know, um, an everyday occurrence you would see on the plantation, you know, black women actually nursing the children of, I mean, it was not uncommon at all, but it always to me captures another, another one of those mysteries of the institution of slavery, that the logic of white supremacy would go, that black people are not even human. They're not fit to live among you, and yet you would entrust them with nursing your children. <laughs> These are the kinds of paradoxes that make, you know, just make it absolutely fascinating to, to to read and think about what it meant to maintain a sense of superiority over the same people that you are dependent upon in the most intimate of ways. Why does a slave ever love? Harriet Jacobs writes wistfully in Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. In the book, Jacobs describes the bonds of love that keep her shackled to her children, and she uses these terms, keep her shackled to her children and slavery as securely as a rope or an iron. Maternal love was sometimes more burden than blessing. Can a mother forget her suckling child? The maternity that was demanded of black women in the service of white families was not a privilege enslaved black women could extend to their own children. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry, I went ahead of myself. Okay. Um, why allow the tendrils of the heart to twine around objects which may at any moment be wrenched away by the hand of violence. Three times in incidents, Jacobs tells us that if it weren't for her children, she would welcome death. When she finally escapes, it is not a lack, but rather a surplus of motherly love that motivates her flight. Enslaved black women who became mothers were faced with awful choices. Morrison's novels are replete with mothers wrestling with the demands of their own maternity. 
motherhood is lethal in Morrison's body of work in general. Setha is hardly unique. In, Su in the novel Sula, uh, Eva Peace, the consummate maternal figure, kills her son. Others, like Ruth in Morrison's Song of Solomon and Arnett in Paradise, try to abort their babies. Other mo mothers, Pauline in The Bluest Eye and Rose Deer in Jazz, inflict their own kind of pain by abandoning their roles as caregivers. Motherhood is ironic in Morrison. Women kill their children in order to save them. Your love is too thick, Paul D. says to Setha and Beloved. Love is or it ain't. Then love ain't love at all, Setha tells him. When African-American women enslaved and free took to lecterns, pen and paper, it was to demonstrate their humanity through their insistence on their motherhood. Beloved is Morrison's contribution to the tradition of black women determined to reveal the tragic inheritance that slavery had bequeathed them. This is also from a, an illustration done by an artist called Kelsey Ataki. The slide reads, this is Setha's back, and when the top of her dress was around her hips and he saw what the sculpture on her back had become, like the decorative work of locksmith too passionate for display, he could, not, he could think but not say, oh Lord, girl. The narrative of the beloved is embodied literally by Setha's body. It is written on her back. It is not a sexy back like Django's back, and it is not a degraded back like the image of Peter the Slave. It is indisputably an awful back, both terrible and something that inspires reverential wonder and fear. Setha is ashamed of her back, just as she is ashamed of her past and, and the desperate choice that she felt she had to make. In order to heal, she must face the legacy that is inscribed on her skin and materialized in the ghost of her murdered child. At the outset of the novel, Setha's future was, matter, was a matter of keeping the past at bay, Marison Dorson tells us. The future is a matter of keeping the past at bay. The skin on her back had been dead for years, we read, signifying her attempts to repress the past. For Setha, these scars constitute traces of past deeds too horrible and violent to either forget or remember, a situation that Morrison calls a perfect dilemma. The brutal whipping she receives as punishment for her attempt to run away is only part of a cluster of events that seek Setha seeks vainly to forget. There is no forgetting in Beloved. The dead rises up and demands to be reckoned with, to be seen, and it's painful. Anything dead coming back to life hurts, says Amy Denver, a runaway white girl who plays an important role in the novel. Not only does she save Setha's life and midwife the delivery She delivers Denver, but then the most important work she does is to read Setha's back for her. She says, see, here's the trunk. It's red and split wide open, full of sap, and this here's the party for the branches, leaves too, looks like, darn if these aren't blossoms, tiny little cherry blossoms. Your back got a whole tree on it. It bloomed. Baby Suds, Setha's mother-in-law, sees Setha's back as a pattern of roses of blood. Paul D. calls it a sculpture, like the decorative work of the Lux for the Ironsmith. It is important that the reader um, understand 
that these readings are performed by women, by white, the white girl Amy Denver, by a black man, and by Setha herself, a black woman. They are the readers of a text, which is Setha's back, written by a school teacher, who was a single most abhorrent character in the novel. Um, enslavement is a process of dismemberment. Africans were divested of their cultures, their languages, and names. Slavery alienated them from their own bodies. And beloved uh, school teacher, the vicious slave owner who comes to wreak havoc on sweet home, is a writer. He is writing a book about slaves. And Setha is charged with mixing his ink. In school teacher's book, which mirrors the overarching narrative of the novel itself, excuse me, of slavery itself, Setha is an animal, a savage. She is forced to submit to the humiliation of a kind of, of being milked, a grotesque parody of uh, Madonna and Child. Setha has to learn to take charge of her body, of her story, and create a counter narrative. For the unlettered slave, the act of writing is the act of remembering what has been dismembered. And below, <coughs> remembering is the only way to heal. We have a little time after I'm going to show you. This is a set. So, uh, Setha, um, this is her mother in law, Baby Sucks, who's a preacher and who's someone who has survived uh, so <coughs> much violence as a former, when she was an enslaved person. Uh, she lost, all of her children were fathered by her owner. She lost most of them um, are dead. But she finds a reason to preach. But she preaches, she, she's a, called an unchurched preacher. Because she doesn't, she doesn't have a degree of divinity. But she is someone who is an organic minister. And her uh, theology is a theology of the body. She's a woman of words, which puts her on par with the school teacher in his godly command of Sweet Home's master narrative. But she's not a traditional preacher. The crowds gather in the clearing to hear her on Saturday afternoons and most Sunday mornings. She tells them the only grace they could have was the grace they could imagine. In other words, they are the masters of their own fates. The day that Baby Suds became free, after more than 60 years of slavery, she noticed her own heartbeat and was thrilled at owning her own body for the first time. She then opened her great heart to those who could use it by becoming an unchurched preacher. Baby Suds performs a secular miracle by force of her own imagination, creating a ritual for former slaves and enabling them to seek a reconciliation with their memories, whose scars survive even generations after the experience of slavery has ended. In this here place, she says to those who come to hear her speak, we flesh, flesh that weeps and laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet in the grass, love it, love it hard. Yonder they do not love your flesh. They despise it. No more do they love the skin on your back. Yonder they flay it. And oh, my people, they do not love your hands. Those they only use, tie, bind, chop off, and leave empty. Love your hands. Raise them up and kiss them. Touch others with them. Put them together. Stroke them on your face. Because they don't love that either. You got to love it. You. And no, they don't love, they in love with your mouth. Yonder out there, they will see it broken and break it again. What you say out of it, they will not heed. What you put into it to nourish your body, they will snatch away and give leavings instead. They don't love your mouth, you have to love it. Toni Morrison has said, it's always seemed to me that black people's grace has been with what they do with language. Once she was asked what she considered distinctive or good about her fiction, the language she replied. It's the thing that black people love so much, the saying of words, holding them on the tongue, experimenting with them, playing with them. It's a love, a passion, 
It functions like a preacher's, to make you stand up out of your seat, see, to make you lose yourself and hear yourself. And beloved, healing... <laughs> and beloved, healing begins with the body and the stories that bodies can tell. Tony Morrison's novel is not only concerned with remembering, the remembering of individual characters, but with the body politic, the national scar of the history of American race relations. We have to recognize and we have to remember <coughs> colorblindness is not progress. We fail one another by pretending not to see what is right in front of us, from the systematic injustices that we virtually that virtually determine the way blackness is lived in this country, down to the differences written on our skins. Beloved reminds us that race and racism are not abstractions. The wounds of our past are not healed. In fact, careful readers of the world around us know that like the characters in Beloved, there is no repressing the past. In fact, repression functions as another form of subjugation. When we claim to forget, to insist on our national amnesia, the past rises up and is hungry for blood. Remembering must be a collective act. It is not the responsibility of black people or white people exclusively to end racism. It won't be easy. We must dismember the master narrative in order to compose a new one. Beloved is a new story about an old story. This is not a story to pass on, we are told at the end of the book. It is our responsibility to remember the horrors of slavery in order to heal from them. Morrison asks her readers to confront the debt assumed by the traumas of slavery to enable us to transform this inheritance into a beloved future. But this is also not a story to pass on. Beloved compels the reader to reimagine re a concealed past as a, as a starting point for repair, which not only summons the ghastly foundations of our nation, but in doing so, initiates conversations surrounding what was lost, established, and still owed. Only then can we close the book and put the story to bed. Thank you. One of the technical difficulties, uh, I think we have time for some questions okay. if people... <clears throat> well, also my secret, my secret little stash of clips. There's great Morrison interviews, of course, on YouTube. I have so much fun preparing for this. I just, just hours just watching the song. So there's great, uh, uh, and then the movie, I have a little clip I was going to show from the um, from Baby Sucks Preaching. But you can see this also, too. It's easy to find it. Baby Sucks Preaching in the Clearing. It was a nice clever word. It's very inspiring, very uplifting. mentioned that this is a new story, but it's the book is now 30 years old. Right? And for a while there, 90s, uh, it was the required reading for advanced high school students, college students. It became uh, the go-to book uh, to explicate the African American experience uh, for young students. Do you think it still holds that position? Are there other things that are uh, taking its place, or do you think it still retains and should retain that? That's the one book that everybody reads place in the uh, mainstream educational <clears throat> experience. Well, you know, I think like, there's so many wonderful books, you know, um, so many, so many great stories about slavery, and. I'm thinking I like to teach this book alongside a book by, by Edward Jones. You know the writer Edward Jones? There's a book called The No World. It's a beautiful, epic story. I mean, it's really engrossing. It's about the, 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 the premise that uh, there's a black man who was a slave who owned slaves. So this was something that was that happened. 
he had slaves, he had, he had two slaves, he's in the next life plantation. But it's really this wonderful imagining of what is reality. But also about human beings, I mean, it, could, it's, it takes place on, an, on a plantation in this small world. But it's this fantastic story about, you know, how we interact with each other, what we know about each other. It's worse. Very different kinds of writing styles. Jones um, loves a long, sweeping sentence. Whereas Morrison, if you know her, this book, the staccato, the rhythms of this book, and she doesn't want to play by those rules. She doesn't want to tell a story about this experience, this incident using, you know, the kind of conventions of, of traditional prose, right? She wants to break those rules. So I like to teach because they're so interesting together. But I, I, I have yet to stop learning from Beloved. I, I, with my students, we were reading it, and, you know, it could take over the whole semester. So we're trying to take it apart. And then we decided one day we're going to read it aloud to each other. And it transformed the entire experience for all of us. And we thought it would be kind of fun to give our voices, you know, our heads a rest. But we were completely engrossed by the way that we told the story by just reading lines together. And Morrison also, she makes choices around punctuation that, in, that invite all kinds of ways, you know, give you various doors to get into it. And I recommend that, you know, sitting in an evening and just reading the lines from the book. Because she wants you to, to move you beyond thought. And she wants to force you to, to, to listen to the way words sound um, and not to think caught in their meaning. So it's a, it's a musical book, and it's a beautiful book. And you're reading this book, and you're kind of going on the waves of this, you know, these, these prose poems, and you're thinking, oh my goodness, someone's just been murdered. You know, it's really <laughs> it's startling because it does this to you. And it sort of becomes a wonderfully terrifying experience. So this book continues to teach me so much. Um, and I do think we do a lot of, you know, at the altar of Tony Morrison, yeah, you know, uh, for good reason. But I, but, but, um, so I'm often suspicious of that. You know, one book. But you know, this is, this is an extraordinary, extraordinary novel that just for me keeps, I keep learning. I keep falling into it and finding more in it. Um, and it's it's a love story, also about a beloved. Excuse me, Seth and Paul D, a man and woman trying to listen to each other. You know, and who had had it worse and trying to forgive each other um, and live with the past. I mean, all of us, so many struggle, you know, living with the past, living with the ancestors and the choices that were made when the children have to contend with their mother. You know, they're just kids. You know, they just want to live their lives, but they have this horrible story. So there's so many things going on. I feel like I never teach, I never, I finish a semester and think, man, we didn't get to half of what <laughs> we're trying to do. So those are, that was a, that was a sort of broad answer to a very good question. Yes. Are you at all hopeful about the future relationships between men and women, black and white? James Baldwin says we always have to have hope. We can't give up hope. Not for the children. We have to have hope. Mm -hmm. um, so I am very hopeful. I think it's a, you know, I'm sure I'm not alone when I say it's a, it feels like a very dark moment, you know, and, and there's no map out of this. But I am hopeful, and I, I think um, in, in an odd and fitting way, so there are so many of us who understand more than ever how deeply united we are around belief systems and ideals, and sometimes it takes the, the kind of horror that many of us are experiencing to remember that, <coughs> to understand how much there is at stake. Um, Isabel Wilkerson, who wrote uh, a book, The Warmth of Other Suns, Oh, yeah. Well, I read her, she wrote a really wonderful piece about the new administration and how we should not despair. Because she was saying, you know, when we see, we have this progress and then there's pushback. And that's historically true. You know, we always want to believe that there's kind of this kind of linear, linear progress. And we're just going to, but in fact, these pushbacks, they're all, what they do is demonstrate how far we did, we are. Mm -hmm. You know, because that, that much anger and resentment comes up. It's because there is progress happening. So I, I, I try to, you know, I, I look for evidence of that. And I certainly think, with, I don't know about you all, generations, our young people coming up, I see a different way of thinking about these issues, about gender and race, in my students. Um, their determination, their uh, commitments, their desires to know and understand, uh, and then my children, you know, and what they are prepared for, and how they see the world. So I do see it when I look behind. I think, okay, 
coming up behind us is, is, is really nice to an army of intellectuals and free-spirited young people, I think, who can lead us. I believe that. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> How about me? <laughs> oh, well, I was shocked to find out where I live, uh, where I live now because of what's happened politically. And it made me very sensitive to how it's alive now, how the strike between black and white are alive, is alive. And I just feel that since the Civil War, there's been so much that's just basically gone underground. And we don't see it because because it's been legislated against. And so I'm 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 concerned about that. That this yeah. may never find a way. We, there's so many things that can't be that le legislation can't touch. Right. You know, we have the it's uh, the, you're right. It goes underground because of one city. It's how do we make the changes? How do we? I believe in interpersonal connection. I think we can affect change. In our interactions, with, I, I I need to believe that because I'm with you. That's uh -huh. it's, it's hard, you know. My students want to know what they can do. You know, where can we? What can we do now with ourselves? You know, and, and but sometimes I think that work just can, the world around us and making the impact and and asking the person that question that uncomfortable question and you know you can change a lot by that. You know, just it's sort of calling people up, people you know and care about, and saying, well, what do you believe, and let's that out. I, I feel that that must be true, you know, because we, we have, we're confronting is that invisible, you know, all this uh, systematic injustice. But people make up systematic injustice. Mm -hmm. You know, people, individual people do that. And people are institute, make up institutions. So if we're going to make institutional change. We have to do it. It has to be, a, it can't be the only place we're doing it. But it has to be a factor. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I think. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, it's not exactly a question. I just wanted to, when you were talking about um, Beloved as like the book that you read in high school, I totally was that year. Like I read it as a 15 year old and loved it, but I recently read it again as a 34 year old with two children, mm -hmm. and it just blew my mind. It was just. I really appreciated the way you talked about the, her description of motherhood and how motherhood was such a huge part of that book. And I didn't see that as a 15 year old. I couldn't have seen that as a 15 year old. Like, you don't, you know, I just didn't think of the world that way. Um, but it was a totally different experience this time. And the horror, you know, like it, it the horror was, was almost unbearable this time. Um, and I think it is such an effective, I don't know. It's just an amazing book, and I'm super excited that you uh, still teach it and we're talking about it. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just really excited to hear about it. Do you think of that? My, my perspective too changed. You know, me as a mother and thinking, holy. And she and she says actually in the interview, you, she, you know, you have to hold your own child in order to really think we're going to sit in judgment on Setha. Hold your own child and say this and what what I. What I'm gonna, my kid is gonna grow up and endure these atrocities. You know, what am I prepared to do? She said she really had to do that. It was very hard, but otherwise she wasn't writing in a truthful way. Yeah. You know, and she was just writing about it, not from inside of it. And it was just, it is, you know, it's hard, hard, really horrible to to think of this. And Margaret Garner, um, who lived a whole life, but you know, who we don't know actually what happened to her. Margaret Garner surviving children. And when I tell my students, I ask them, why would that be so? You know, she had a specific purpose for the abolitionist movement. But once they didn't get the, what they wanted, right, to set this precedent, she wasn't interesting to them anymore. So here are these children. There's no document. There's no, there's no record of what happened to them. Because no one cared. It was only because she had done this thing. She represented, you know, the cause. But the real lives, the real experiences, I mean, what about those kids? What about all the kids? You know, these are the things, again, Marge, is charging us to remember, to take a moment and say, what about those those kids? Uh, because there are no monuments for them. Thanks. Yes. 
Uh, I'm just curious whether you had a chance to go to the African American Museum and what your response to the way the stories are told. I have yet to get inside the building. Um, I've been to the grounds and I was there at the dedication, but I have not been able to go to gotten tickets yet. And I heard it's extraordinary. Have you been? No, I was also on the yeah. grounds. <laughs> I heard it's absolutely extraordinary. And I can't wait for the experience of just of going through and seeing seeing what that's like. But I don't know if anyone else has, has anyone's been able to go. And what did you think? Oh, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Beautifully done all the way around. Yeah. Just don't forget about it. And it, the way it starts with the slave boats coming in and have your way down in the basement. It's dark, you could hardly see them. Mm -hmm. And eventually come up to the earth, the lighter of times. So mm -hmm. You can start from the bottom and go up and start from the top and go down, and you get the different story. Mm -hmm. There's just so much to it, so you can't possibly take it in on one time. Yeah, it's real time now. Or when multiple times. Very lucky to be able to Yes, just a comment on the museum. I managed to get tickets today. And you have to go online and three months out. It comes up at nine o'clock in the morning. That's great. That's wonderful. Yes. 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 You also think that it's important to teach slave narrative, and I have a question for the audience. I'm very curious about this sitting here. How many people here have read a first-person slave narrative? I'm just curious. Because I only did, I mean, I think I read Frederick Douglass when I was a student in high school, but I only recently read a, another slave narrative, and it, it was extremely impactful, like as an adult, to read this. Why wasn't, why haven't I read this? over, you know, why hasn't it been pushed in my face? So I'm curious, do you also teach slave narrative? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the more books I have to leave out of a semester than I can include, but it's so important. And I often, like, use the, more tonight we read Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, and it's exactly this kind of story, Morrison saying, you know, the, the, the writer of a slave narrative who says, no, I have to drop the veil, there are two things. She can't tell certain things, because she's talking about being sexually exploited, and no one in 1861 wants to hear that. So she has to tell these stories very delicately. But those writers, and so far, so they were fugitives. They weren't supposed to be able to read and write, as punishable as we know by death. You could be a white person teaching about, you might be jailed and face death too. <clears throat> so you're, you're doing this thing, you're learning to read and write. It, it actually must be terror and defiance. Um, and you create a narrative. I mean, that's hard enough, you know? Um, and it's a compelling narrative. And you're also engaged, you know, uh, it's one of my favorite, my favorite lines from Incidents in the Life of Slavery, the whole story about how she became a mother, getting her freedom, freedom, it cost her her motherhood. She had to leave her children to be free. Um, and she, spent the, she wrote her book and said, I, what I want is my, for my family to be together again. The authors of male uh, uh, narratives, men authors, wrote about, you know, freedom with a capital F, you know, on the frontier, and I did it all by myself, thank you very much. <laughs> um, whereas the, often the women writers had the kind of consequence of family. You know, I'm, I want to be with my mother, I need to take care of her, so my freedom for myself is important, but really the community is what I'm a part of. And uh, so there's Harriet Jacobs, she writes in her book, um, Reader, my story ends in freedom, and not in the usual way with marriage. Mm -hmm. Direct mm -hmm. nod yes. to oh. Jane here. And so not only are you a political uh, activist mm -hmm. and you're flitting and bl bullets flying over your head, you're, you know, giving a side eye to Jane Eyre. You know, you're <laughs> making that critique. You know, well, that might be nice for you, upper middle class white woman, to end in marriage, but I am trying to be free. <laughs> so I just, I mean, to me, it's the whole world of these stories. It's just, there's so much happening. And I just always tell my students, let's take a moment and just, just remember what it took to get this book to your hands. Mm -hmm. All the work that went into this, and you were, we're going to read it and pay attention, because this, everything was at stake in the production of this book. They're remarkable documents. And you can also go online now, thanks to the Library of Congress, and hear uh, former slaves talk about their experiences, often very deep South acting. It's really, you have to like, take time with it. Um, 
but it's but they're remarkable stories and, and mundane stories too about everyday life um, <coughs> and big ones too so what a re what a fantastic um, archive we have uh, thanks first to the WPA and then to the Library of Congress I saw, I saw another hand, did I? yes uh, you talked about um, language being loved by black people could you say more about that Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Morrison wrote about this, and she was talking about that, and um, when, when someone asked her what is distinctive about your own voice, she was saying that is. And I think, you know, for, if I may, um, when we think about culture, and for African Americans, again, to come to this country and to be, um, first, you know, lumped together as one people, you know, who, but you're not, you know, you have, here's my language, and here's, it has nothing to do with your language, but I'm, I'm forced to, um, adapt, and I'm forced to give up. I mean, and, and it's more than just giving up, right? I, it's been ripped away from me, everything that I know. Um, but that's how your life is preserved, right, in language. Because there are no, no one's taking your, uh, your oral history, you know, no, no one's making an archive and writing your biography. So, and you don't even have access to, pen and to, to, to written language, so it's through the storytelling through narrative and storytelling. That's where the culture itself resides. So it's not only that the language is a container of culture, but it is culture mm -hmm. and stories. You know what I'm talking about? So um, for, for thinking about the world of slaves, you know, how you um, stay alive through spirituals and hymns. Um, and your hymns are talking about God, but at the same time, you're being told that that God uh, thinks you should be a slave. So I'm having to use Christianity and think about ways to put my own signature on it so I can be part of that master narrative. Um, so using literally the master's tongue in order to um, preserve myself, right? A language that all of the documents in this language, all of them are trying to um, communicate my inhumanity. But I have to survive. And I'm going to survive by taking that language and, and putting my own uh, spin on it. You know, we talk about um, the African American literary liter liter tradition begins in the oral word. It has to, right? With work songs and um, and hymns um, and folk tales that survive and continue. So the the act of storytelling for so many African Americans is an act of survival. It's an act where I can, if I'm there's a wonderful, anybody read uh, the great book, Their Eyes Were Watching God? Mm -hmm. So you know this book, Trish. Yeah. And it's so important for these characters who work in the fields all day. That's what they do. They're, um, they're, their skins were used by the boss man. And other, you know, they're, they're just a brute working in the fields. And what do they do when they come home? They sit and they pass nations in their mouths. You know, and they have commentary for everything that's happening politically, and they're critiquing each other. So language is about feeling human and exercising humanity. Um, and so I very much agree with Toni Morrison there. I think it's so endemic. Um, African Americans have been trying to write themselves in, into existence. You know, again, trying to create counter narratives um, in order to establish my, own, my personhood. So I think it's so endemic to a tradition, um, but also language as play too, you know? And I think it often happens with people who don't have access to traditional literacy. You know, you find inventive and ways to, to, uh, to twist words and to, to reinvent them and to reimagine them, you know? So that creativity is, that is necessity, too. So I think that's what, what she was talking about. Yes. So we're not the only country in the world that has passed over slavery. Um, we're not the only country that has committed atrocities against the minority group of people. Why do you think that our country, having spent so many years attempting to correct it, has not been able to fix this issue, whereas other countries have been able to do so in a much shorter amount of time. Well, you know, I'll, one, I'll say one thing. I know people, we could probably move on at some point soon. Um, it, I find it all, it's always striking how often we revisit slavery, and again, in American cinema. You know, it's like every couple of years or some of you, you know, what, 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 we can't repress it, you know, obviously. We keep revisiting it for what reason. Um, but it is, it's, um, it's the well we keep returning to. And 
it's not just that writers and filmmakers are returning to that well, but there are audiences who are, you know, buying the books and watching the films in order to do what? Make sense of what? You tell me. You know, what does it represent? Why is it? Why is, is this country unique in that respect or not? What makes it impossible for us to, I would say, with Morrison's saying, we haven't yet contended with it at all. So the idea of moving beyond it is just, you know, that's part of that kind of colorblindness thing. Like, I'm just not going to see it. We haven't reckoned with what is happening. You know, we haven't had the truth and reconciliation kind of moment, you know, in this country where we can really contend with what, you know, this, this slide I showed at the very beginning of the, the lynched bodies and awful, awful images. But I tell my students, well, watch the image. See that black guy there? That's your great uncle Paul. What I mean to say is he's just a guy, all right? He's not, he's not uh, Satan. Okay, these were ordinary people committing these acts. And that's what we have to contend with. I mean, it's really convenient, right, to imagine, you know, that, that racist on the, you know, on the horse. Um, and, and we don't, a lot of these races are not on horses anymore, as we were saying, right? They're doing their work <coughs> behind the um, scenes. And so that, if that, that very visible, you know, um, antagonist, I, can, I know how I feel about him, but what if it's, what if it's more complex? And what if, you know, um, this was literally part of everyday life, part of community life. You know, lynchings were spectacles. People went to have picnics. And it is unimaginable. But at the same time, at one point, it was not, not that long ago. So that, I think, is something that we have to contend with. You know, I'd rather do that, really contend with that, to figure out who we are as human beings, you know, and, and what does it mean than just exit away, turn away, or, or even dismiss, you know, great Uncle Paul and say he was just evil. What if he wasn't evil? You know, what if that was just the way that the, his world worked? Let's unpack, and that's the harder one. Because okay. then I think we have to look at ourselves. You know, and ask what are the things that we will, or how will history judge us? You know, the things that we participate in every day um, without thinking about it, we excuse ourselves. Well, you know, there'll be a generation from now, so why didn't you take that stand? Um, so those, that's a harder work, I think, you know, um, and we have not done it. Yes? I was going to say, if anyone has not read The Case for Reparations by Tom and Easy Coates, um, mm -hmm. please go yeah. read that, because yeah. I think it's, this history continued on through public policy and um, structural and personal choices that we have made as a country that absolutely have negated any efforts to try to address um, the crimes that we continue to commit. The case for reparations. Uh, it's by Tallahassee Coates. And actually, you know what? I've got. I have <laughs> that's his, that's his, uh, his book. In case we got to him, <laughs> um, yes. So this this is his book between the world and me. But I just he, a, a book came out, a collection of his essays, um, and among that those essays is an essay called The Case for Reparations, and it is stunning. It, his journalism is outstanding, and you will read this for you know you're talking to all of us. It's a fantastic. So I think we'll just leave that there. And say that it's an essay that should be read. But this book between the world, and I just think he's just fantastic. Um, yes? Oh, we're still going. I just had a um, thought about the great Uncle Paul thing um, that brings it back to Beloved. Um, and I'm interested what your thoughts are about, I think the character is named Mr. Garner. Yes. And by her, her owner before she, uh, at Sweet Home. That's right. Who is sort of painted mm -hmm. in the beginning. You think, oh, he was kind of a good guy. Mm -hmm. It was like he let them, um, he let them do a lot of things. Like he sort of treated them like his boys, um, like his men. But then, um, but then you discover that actually he was he, he made baby son or he made the older sorry it's been, I can't remember the name but the, he made the husband pay for his mother's freedom with like however many years of extra work. And so he wasn't actually. I guess I'm having a hard time explaining. But I feel like the point was. We thought he was a good guy, but actually he was just as racist and part of the system as everybody else. He just wasn't that guy on the horse being evil at school teacher. And I would even go further. I wouldn't even use those same terms to describe Mr. Burner. Because you're right, I mean, he, yeah, he did those things, and he was a slave owner. Um, but you're, I like your, you know, uh, some, uh, the, the kind of um, semantic shift you made, because he treated them like men. They called themselves the sweet home men with Mr. Burner. Right. 
Um, he respected them. They were his slaves, you know, but he treated them with respect. Um, he understood the marital relation and respected it. So is it the same as a school teacher? I would say no. Um, and I think that they understood it differently too. Um, and so I don't think I'm venturing into territory, I'm not sure, I'm prepared to. But, um, but he's in there, I think, for a reason. You know, he's in there for a reason because he is participating in the same system. And I would say he's still a good guy. Um, and he's also a slave owner. And it's not the, you know, how, how do we reconcile, I think, all of those things, you know? Um, and Morrison gives us that because it does, she doesn't make it easy for us. You know, there is a school teacher who's just, you know, we can get all of our pitchfork for school teacher. Um, but then this comes to Mr. Gardner, you know, he's, he's, he's a less, uh, he's not, what do I mean to say? Um, yes. I'm just thinking there's probably a lot of people today that are good guys that are really nice to their family, loving parents, grandparents, but they might own a lot of stock in private prison companies. <laughs> or they might be lobbying for really harsh drug laws that lock up young people and throw away the key for their whole lives. And how do we, you know, I think, you know, we're a room full of mostly white people, and if any of our kids had a brush with the law or some illegal substances in their car, it's very unlikely that they would have any kind of consequences like that. And how do we look away from that every day? You know, are we on the phone to our legislators about drug laws? And, and I've talked to a lot of people in this community about it because it's something I just feel so strongly about. And I have people say, oh, that's like 20th on my list of things I'm worried about. And it's like, well, what if that was your kid? What, you know, how do we fail in that looking at other people as our own kids? That's right. Mm -hmm. how, yeah, how can, I mean, that's, I, I don't know about you, you know, I feel so saturated all the time, right, on, on the daily with these questions. Mm -hmm. You know, how can I perform good at citizenship? Mm -hmm. What does that look like now? Um, is it enough to write my check to NPR? What are the things that, it, you know, to go to a march, it, it, even that? You know, where, who are these in, enemies? You know, I'm reading the New York Times and suddenly I'm feeling very satisfied with myself. <laughs> and thinking, this is not really, there's a, there's, a, there's a whole, there's a world right around me of people who don't think this is real. The news I'm reading in the New York Times. How, how, do, we, how do we continue with this, you know, living, side by side and operating in completely different police systems. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just a corner, I mean, that's sort of what pulled it, how do we intervene? And that's, um, sorry, sorry. Oh, please. She was <laughs> pulling up a book for you. The Hate You Give? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh The Hate You Give is so amazing. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the Hate You Give? The Hate You Give. The Hate You Give, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You oh, haven't read it? I've never read it. Oh, oh you should read it. It's a young adult novel. We had a big year about it last yeah. summer. Yeah. It's, so good. Yeah. it's a young adult novel. Yeah. I was just asking. By Angie Thomas. Yeah. Sorry, it, By Angie Thomas. It's being made into a movie, oh, well. too, with, like, every great star. Very excited. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not sorry at all. I'm kidding. It's great. How many people in here know that Middlebury has an anti-racism film series going. It meets on the first Wednesday, also like this, right? Well, it's not good. We're going to fix that for next year. But um, in February, we're showing Whose Streets, which is about Ferguson. Um, I hope people will come. Who's right? Anybody read this book? No. Another fantastic title. If you're looking to put all this together, you're looking for new titles. This I found very hard to read. I had to kind of lie down. You know, it really tells the truth in a way that's it's the things we live with every day, and we accept and we can ignore, and make it possible for us to ignore now. Um, but it's a wonderful book. I learned so much. I think we should wrap it up. Okay. <laughs>